So my name is Marcus. Uh, this is my Twitter. If you want to follow me, I work uh, at Tinder. Uh, we're hiring. If you're looking for a very nice job to do animations and things like that, come talk to me later. Uh, so yeah, let's get this going. Um, so motion design. So I want to start a little bit about talking about the history of it and how we came up to something called motion design. So long, long time ago, approximately 3,000 before Christ, uh, we were already trying to bring motion uh, to something that we can represent to. Uh, you, if you can see there, we have this Bronze Age pottery trying to show how goats leap uh, on the farm and things like that. We also have the Vitruvian Man from Leonardo da Vinci, which has different angles of the same man to try to show that this is actually moving and trying to do any motion. Uh, we've, been to, we've been trying to do this since forever. It's not something new. Disney was uh, a really groundbreaking company. They really changed the game when it came to motion. Uh, they came up with a lot of principles and a lot of uh, new information that helped a lot. Uh, figured out how to do animation in the best way possible. Uh, and they came up with something that had been used a lot and that it's very useful and very interesting called the 12 principle of animation. I don't know if you have ever heard about it, but uh, it's very, very interesting. There is even a book uh, that talks about it. And those are the 12 um, uh, principles. Uh, we're not going to take a look at all of them, but I select some of them because I found it very interesting on the way that you can really see the material design inspired themselves in some of those uh, principles to make the animations and the motion design that we have today. One of them is staging. So if you look at this animation, I'll give you a second to look at it. You can really see what's going on in a very well way. You see that first, and then you see he's coming, and then you see a reaction of people laughing about it. There is a staging, there is everything. And everything goes well. Look what happened when we don't have the staging. It's just a mess. Everybody's away, you don't know where to look, you don't know what to do, everything is very messy. So this is something that you really want to pay attention to, and, and, and it's something that has been doing since like a long, long time, since the 40s and 50s, uh, when Disney were drawing Mickey Mouse. We have that in material design today, too. Uh, we, we can see here in this animation, for example, that we are, tr we are setting up the stage by showing one thing at a time and trying to draw attention to the user, to the things that it's important for them. Same thing in this one, and even in this one, we give the, the idea that there is more information to be found if the user scrolls uh, just because of the animation that it does. Another principle that I want to talk about is what they call follow-through overlapping action and drag, which is basically uh, overlapping uh, animation. Uh, so if you look at here, uh, you can see what is what's talking about in detail is the bounce that we all know, love and hate. Uh, there is the drag at the beginning, and then there is uh, this whole uh, follow-through information that happened on animation. It's very used uh, uh, on cartoons uh, nowadays. We have the same on material design too. We have the same on Android. So when, when the new navigation system that came out uh, for Pi, we can see here that when we slide that up, it overlaps a bit, but it comes back to give you an idea that there is more to discover, there's more to see. It's the same principle. We also have it when you do the Facebook bubbles. Here you can't see very well, but if you try it on your phone, you will always see that your finger is going to go faster than the bubble. And the reason is, is because the bubble has a weight, has, a, has a, 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 a place to go, a path to follow. So your finger, it cannot follow your finger. It won't make much sense. Another principle I want to talk about is the slow in and slow out. That's very, I think most of you are used to it. It's very basic. It's uh, the interpolator one. Uh, here you can see on the bottom a car moving without an uh, uh, interpolator. It just feels uh, unnatural. It just doesn't feel like it's, it's something real. While on the top, you have one that have an accelerator and decelerator. It makes much more sense because a car doesn't start moving at 30 kilometers per hour. It starts at zero and it gets to 30 kilometers at some point. So that's what makes sense. I didn't even put an example for this one because I know everybody, I feel like everybody is like used to it. This one is very interesting when I was looking at it because when I first saw arcs uh, on the motion design uh, uh, guidelines for Google, I just thought it was a cool thing. It was like, oh, okay, it's not linear. It's, 
it's an arc. So looking at the book, uh, the the history of uh, motion design by by Disney, uh, we actually I actually saw that we actually have lots of arcs. Uh, most of the movements that we do on the day to day are based on arcs. Uh, we don't usually make linear movements when we're walking, when we're jumping, when we're sleeping, when we're lying down. It's mostly arc movements, and that was very interesting. And that's what makes when you see an animation that is actually doing an arc instead of doing a linear movement, that's why it feels so much natural. And it's things that is in our unconscious and we don't even know. Here's another example, and this is very subtle. It's a very good example because it shows very well the difference if you, when it slows down, but when it's not slowing down, you don't really notice, but the difference is really there. There is an arc movement here and there that makes the thing more natural and more, uh, more uh, familiar to us when we do everyday uh, uh, things. We also have very mature design in motion. Uh, it's there to help us, to make us, feel, make us feel at home, make us feel like it's something that it's familiar to us and it's much better. Uh, we also have it here in another example, and we also have on Google Play before. I used to do a lot of arc animation, and it's something that we are also familiar with. So uh, those are some of the principles. If you're very interested, I really recommend uh, Disney's book, uh, The History of uh, Design. It's very, very good, and it's a very, very pretty book to put on your shelf, too. So I definitely recommend it. When Material Design came out, that's what they were trying to do. They were trying to do what Disney did for cartoons. They're trying to bring that for apps, make it more usable. This is a video from 2014, and it's already saying it all. We just have to understand it. And even them at that time wasn't understand it very well. But it's just when we bring everything to what we are just used to, it makes more sense. So what Google uh, praise, it's not different than what Disney praise. Uh, motion design needs to be informative. You need to know what's going on and you need to show the user what, why this is happening. It's just not a polish. It's not just something that is cool to look at. It has to be focused. You can't have, like we saw on the staging, you can't have lots of things happening at the same time because your attention is going to be confused. You don't know what to look at. You don't know what to pay attention to. Uh, like just here, you see the thing going up. You don't even need the, the text swipe up to answer. Just by the movement, you would know right away that you just have to swipe up to answer. And it also has to be expressive. Like in the case where you get the password wrong here, the animation is very aggressive, while when you get it right, it's very smooth and very subtle. All that to say that everything that we try to do in apps and it makes it better is just because we're making it more similar to our day-to-day -day lives. Like, for example, this doorknob. If you see a doorknob and you need to use it, you know what to do. You're going to bring it down. You're not going to bring it up. You're not going to push it. You're not going to pull it. You're just going to bring it down. You know what to do. The same thing should be with apps, but you'll be surprised how many apps don't do that, actually. One example is Spotify. Are you gonna, is, how many of you here use Spotify? Yeah, nice. So I don't know if as frustrated as I am, but every time I use Spotify, I hate the fact that I can't swipe up this thing. I can only tap it. You know, the animation goes up, the animation goes down, and it just feels like it should, I should be able to slide it up and slide it down, but I just can't. It's extremely frustrating. It drives me crazy. If you use play music, for example, they do it very well, even though the service is not that good. Um, <laughs> that's just a detail. Um, if my animation plays, OK. So here you see uh, when I get to the, to the artist, and I just choose a song. It will slide from the bottom, and it will give me the impression that that thing is coming from the bottom, and I just can slide up later. And it just makes sense. It's smooth, and it doesn't need any tutorial to teach the users how to do that, because it just makes sense. Spotify, though, it's not that bad. They have something that I found very interesting. It's very cool. I don't know if few users have noticed. But here, if you go to a playlist and you play a song, like we're doing here, and then you play the next song that comes after it, you will see that on the bottom where they have that thing there, it slides to the left. And then it slides to the right if you put it on the one before. Nowhere in the app, Spotify tells you that you can actually swipe there to change music. But the animation itself is kind of inviting you to try it. And that way, you avoid having tutorials, you avoid having different buttons, you just have an, an animation and a motion trying to teach your users how to use your own app. 
okay, Marcus, I understand. It was fun. I, I, I really believe animations are good and all the stuff, but don't be Google. How do we do all those stuff? Because like, we know it's cool, but how do we do that? So one of the first thing I can give you as a, as a advice on how to do great animations is to think like an animator. You really need to think like one because one of the things that can be a big trouble for you when you're doing your layout, it's nesting, for example. Because when you have lots of nesting uh, layouts and you're trying to move some something from one place to the other or one, I one view to another view or to another layout, it just make everything more complicated. If you really want to do that, you have to detach it, you have to animate it, then you have to attach it to another layout. You don't want to do that. So that's one of the first things that you should do. Just think like an animator. Plan the animations ahead, talk to your designer, he's your friend, she's your friend. Uh, they, they're not there to make your life miserable. They just talk to them and make it work. Then we come to how can we do animations. So before I can come to, to what I really want to talk about today, which is motion layout, I want to take a look on what are the options that we had until today. One of them is the object animator. Um, I don't know if any of you have, have ever used it. Uh, just like many things in life, there's lots of ways of doing animations in Android. That's one of them. Uh, you can just animate a property. And for example, in this case, I want to animate from top to bottom. And I can just do that, put a duration, put a start, and that's it. It's, uh, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, there's some drawbacks. Um, it doesn't support simultaneous changes on several objects. So if you're trying to do like different animations, different views, and things on at the same time, it gets very complicated. And um, if you don't use a property object like I'm using there, view.y, it will use reflection, and it's not very performant for your application. Um, another option that we have is to use Animation classes. So here in this case, I'm using layout.start animation, and I'm using a translate animation. There are some other ones that we can use. It works too. You can do the same thing, same way, and it's very little amount of lines. But it also has its drawbacks. It requires several instances together in an animation set if you want to like synchronize different views and do like those crazy things that happens on material design. And it has limited property that can be animated. And it's views pixel only. So depending on how you do it, when you click, when you try to tap it later, it's not going to work. You're not going to have feedback. You can also try to use the animate method. Uh, it's very straightforward and it's very useful if you're trying to do something very simple. Uh, just moving, just changing the alpha. You don't care about controlling the the, the animation velocity. You don't, don't don't you don't care about pausing or anything like that. So that's pretty good. That does that does the job. But if we're trying to do like material design, motion, and animation, that's that's really not the best thing that's gonna help us uh, right now. So one of the things that I like uh, is the value animator. Uh, the reason why is because when you use a value animator, you can you have the animated fraction and you have the animator value. In this case, I'm going from zero to 300. And the cool thing about that is that you have lots of power about that. You have the value that is going to be updated all the time when you add the update listener. So for example, if we're trying to do an animation like this one, where the first view goes and then the second views come back, we can easily do that in one only animation, uh, in one only animator. We don't need two, three animators to be able to do that. Because we have the animated value that is being updated all the time, we can just set it to the view. Uh, for the first one, for the second one, on the, on the, on, for the other way around, one is going to be negative, the other, gonna be, the, one, the other one is going to be positive. And then at the same time, because you have the animation fraction that goes from 0 to 1, you can also do things like alpha. You can do things like control. Uh, for example, I want to do this animation when it's a halfway through, or it's 30% through, because you can always check the value if it's 0 0.3, 0 0.7, it's more than this and that. So you have lots of power when you're using that. It's better con you have better control over the properties we, uh, we want to animate. And you can make multiple views at the same time. And you have the animated fraction that I like a lot, because you really can play with that very well to do your thing. Um, but one of the most fun things that we can do today is constraint set animations. 
So constraint layout uh, was introduced in 2016. Uh, today is the default layout when we start new projects. And a very cool thing that you can do is do a constraint set animation. So what's cons constraint set, just to give a very quick overview. So everything that you set on a constraint layout, it's a constraint set. So if you're saying that the right of a view is connected to the, to the, to the parent, that's a constraint set. If uh, that view is going to be a, a match parent, that's a constraint set. So anything that puts that view in, the, uh, in, in your layout in a certain way will be a constraint set. So if you want to do a constraint set animation, all you need is a star and an end uh, layout. So in this case, for example, I have a title and a description that at the beginning is out of the screen, and at the end is appearing. And that, that's basically just all you need. Uh, on, your, on your screen that you want to animate, you can just uh, do a load of the layout. Uh, it's going to get the constraint set. Constraint set it uses a, a mathematical algorithm for the positions of the views. So it basically just uh, gets it and applies it for the new one. Uh, so here you can use the transition manager, begin this late transition, and then you just say, look, constraint set, uh, apply to the, the, my first view that I had before and then the animation will play out by itself. Here I have an example, which is the one, oops, that was too fast, uh, which is the one that was played, uh, that I was showing before. That's it. Um, it's, very, it's very easy to use. Uh, it lets you synchronize different views animations with ease. So you can have like five, six animations appearing, disappearing. You can control the velocity. You can control how they're going to appear and all the stuff just by saying the, 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 the final position and the beginning position. So it's very useful. And, and your layouts become very flat, so you, you have to care a little bit less about what I said at the beginning of thinking like an animator. You, the constraint layout is already setting you to success because it's letting everybody to be in the same level. So now we have what they call motion layout. So the motion layout is very, very interesting and it's very cool. So basically it's a subclass of constraint layout. And the way you can see that and why it exists, it's just like a mix of property animation framework, transition manager, and coordinate the layout. It's uh, fully declarative, so it's not expected you to be writing any code. It's basically everything on layout. So everything that is happening and everything that's going to animate and all the properties that are going to appear, it's done in layout only. You, you, don't, you don't write any code. And there will be tooling support that you can create keyframes like you're editing a video, really, on, a, on a Adobe Premiere or things like that, but it's just not where yet. I had to do everything by hand. Uh, so here's an example. So it's a very simple example. Uh, one thing that uh, motion layout is actually very useful, I forgot to put on my slides, is that motion layout is usually uh, used for interactive animations. So that means, for example, when you're scrolling and something else is moving based on that scroll, or when you're moving and uh, dragging something and you want something else to drag together or something else to react to that, that's when you want to use motion layout. So it's an animation that has basically a sick. If you want just to play something and let it go, then motion layout may not be the best choice. So in this case, I am dragging the hello world, and it's following a, a clear path. I can just let it go, and it will also go to the end destination. Uh, so how, how, how do we do that? So all we need, we need a layout start, uh, where we're beginning from. Uh, in this case, a very simple hello world. Uh, that's going to translate to a motion layout. If you pay attention to the, to the XML at the beginning, um, it, you can see that it's using motion layout. It's not using constraint layout. That uh, you really have to do that. Uh, it's expected that you use the, the, the UI token because those are a lot of properties that you have to set very often. You don't want to be doing that. Um, and then you need the uh, end layout where you're going to have the end uh, animation on where it's going to end. Uh, which is pretty simple here. It's just in another place, and um, and all's good. Then you will need a third layout, a third XML, which is going to be the scene, the motion scene. So here you're going to define a transition. You're going to say what's your layout start and what's your layout end, and then what's going to happen. It's going to be a, in this case, for example, it's going to be a swipe. And then you're going to tell him, like, look, what's going to be swiped? Is it, oh, okay. 
it's the hello world text view. So I'm putting that on the anchor ID, if you, if you can see. Then the touch anchor slide is which direction I want it to go, in my case to the right. And also the drag direction would have to be to the right. So that means if I try to drag to the left, nothing's going to happen. And then I have to go back to my first layout, my start layout, and I have to tell them. Uh, I have to tell that layout that this is my scene. So I put the layout description, and I, I, I put it to the scene, and that's it. That's all I need, and the animation works. That's, that's, that's all you need to make it work. It's, it's pretty simple. But we know that material design uh, animations are more complex than that. So let's try to do something else. Let's try to have maybe another view that's going to react to the movement of that view. How do we do that? How can make motion layout make it easier? So here, I'm going to add a image view that's going to be in the top left at the beginning. And then at the end, I want it to go the bottom left, and I want it to be smaller. But I don't want to, I don't want to move that. I don't want to touch that, that image view and drag it. I want to drag the one that I was dragging before, and I just want this image view to react to it. So basically, that's the animation I'm looking for. When, when I drag, the other image view goes together. It's just reacting to it. And um, I'm not going to show you the code, because there's no code. So basically, just by adding the image view at the beginning and the end, it was automatically, it just considered that, OK, so you want that image view in the bottom at the end of the animation, so I'm just going to do that to you. So that's it. If you just wanted to react to another view, you can do that. If you want to have more control, though, then I, I things get a little bit spicy. But it's not that complicated. So that's when we start to use a keyframe set. So uh, have you ever edited? The videos or things like that, flash on the old times. It's not that different. So basically, between your start position and your end position, you're going to have a path. And during that path, you can break it down in many points. And those points can go from 0 to 100. And you can tell what, you, you can set up things to happen on those points. Um, so that's basically what I wrote there. Uh, so like, let's say, for example, here we're going to use two points. We're going to use 20%, and we're going to use 50% very soon. So at that, at that point, we can say, look, with the, with the keyframe set, I can say here, when you are in the position 20 of your, of your key point, I want this to happen before you get to your end position. And then when it gets to the 51, I want this something else to happen before you get to your end position. So how do we do that? This is what we had before, uh, very simple, just to do the swipe. This is what we need. You go there, you put a keyframe set, and then you put a key position, because we're trying to change the position. I want, in this case, I want that when the Pikachu is in the 20% of its way to the final destination, I want it to move to the right. I want it to, like. The key position type is like parent relative. So that means that the percentage I'm putting that is relative to the parent. That means uh, the main view. And I want to go 50% to the right. Uh, that's why it's positive. If it was negative, it would be 50% uh, to the left. And I want that to happen when it's in the position 20. That means when it's 20% on the way to go to the final. That's what frame position means. And I need to know which the target is, because I, I may have many views, right? And I want them to act differently. So in my case, it's just the image view, which is called, it has the IG Pikachu. So just by adding those lines, this is the result. You can see that Pikachu is going, and he's going, he's kind of going to the right doing an arc animation. And you can also notice that it's, it's, end, it's arriving to the most, the furthest most to the right before it gets to the middle, because I chose the position 20 on the keyframe. If I had chosen another position, 30%, it would be different, and 40% different, 50% different. 
Let's try something else. Uh, now, uh, let's try to turn uh, Pikachu 90 degrees. Let's, let's try to rotate it. So what we need to do now, I'm going to change a rotation attribute. So I need the key attribute uh, property. So here, I, I, it's very straightforward. I'm saying that I want it to rotate 90, 90 degrees, and I want it to happen at position 50. That means that halfway through uh, the, my, your path, I want you to be 90 degrees. So it's going to make sure that that's going to happen. And then I tell my target. In this case, I want it to be Pikachu. So let's see what happens. Uh, you can see that you can see that it arrived to the furthermost uh, position to the right uh, before it gets to the before it ends rotating because of the keyframe position. So you have to use your uh, your imagination a bit. You have to create like a kind of a path that you're gonna have between your start and end, and then kind of draw points that you're gonna have there, and to be able to figure out at which point you want your animations to happen. So a keyframe set has. Um, those attributes, the key attributes that you can change. Uh, you can change any view property, like uh, rotation, like uh, things like that, like alpha. Uh, you can also select the target. If, if you wanted to do a certain curve, you can set up there, progress, uh, and, and things like that. So it's pretty simple. Uh, the progress property is very important. So if you want uh, it to react to, for example, a scroll or coordinate a layout that is going up, you can, you can use the, you can use the over scroll of your scroll view or, or your recycler view to be able to set up the progress from 0 to 100%. So you, that's how you can match uh, your motion layout with uh, your scroll view or your coordinate layout. Uh, you also have uh, the key position that you can change. Uh, and then you have those properties. You can do percent %x, percent %y, uh, frame position, uh, target, transition easy, uh, curve fit, and, and all those stuff. Uh, this is just. Uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, motion layout is extremely more powerful than that. You can do much more stuff. But I hope that uh, with this overview, you were able to see how those crazy animations that we see on the material design website doesn't look that impossible anymore, and that it's, uh, it's more accessible uh, by using layout like this or even using the old animations that we already had before. So um, to wrap up, uh, think like an animator. Think about it. Uh, you have to plan your animation before. You have to think about your layout hierarchy like this and, and, and do things, set you up for success. Uh, just like when you're training a dog, you want to set him up to, for success so he to, de to do his treat and, and training. Set you up for success. Don't make things easy, complicated for you. Just put it flat and make sure that your animation is on the right way. Use motion layout for interactive animations. So every time you want to scroll and animate something at the same time, or things to appear synchronized, or even to like uh, do choreography, that's when motion layout is going to be your best friend. And animations are not always just polish. They are an important part of your app. Uh, just don't let it like for the end, or don't do it very well. Just uh, pay attention to it. Um, that's it. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer.